Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back because it's rude. And now, Twitch It Off and Media presents The Joys of Mudville, a look at the current state of baseball. Now here are your hosts, Scott McIntyre, Andy Tom Chesson, and James Christopher. Yeah. That's right. We are meditating out here. This is The Joys of Mudville. We have got Andy Tom Chesson with us. Andy, how you doing? I am super peachy keen. It's a beautiful day in Houston, Texas this morning. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be 73 degrees here. I'm excited about it. Like, that's where we need to be locked in. I mean, it's like you could be getting ready for some sort of spring-related practice in warm weather climates right now. Like, you yeah, shipping equipment if it was a normal year. If it was a normal year. Scotty Mack, how you doing? Hey, I'm almost as great as Rob Manfred, who is the most optimistic commissioner known to man. Can I make According. you? Uh, can I make you feel a little better? What, what you got in mind, big guy? Uh, I don't know if you saw oh. the latest edition of Screen Jocks, but you have been given the award, the Director's Choice Award for Best Director for the Art Ninth Festival. Well, that'll ruin the award for everybody to follow. I, I greatly appreciate it by R. Um, I, I, I truly do. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I, I really, I didn't know. I haven't seen Screen Jocks. It's the, the day job and, and the week have, have, have been quite quite yeah. busy. So that's a uh, dude. Thank you. Thank you very much for You're that. Very... That's, kind of, that's kind of cool. And I'm looking forward to um, getting your buckle. The ninth, the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th <laughs> are don't all together. Put that evil on me, Scott. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like seven festivals that. at once. So no, yeah. that's, that's pretty cool, man. I, no, I appreciate that. And, and uh, whoever wins it next year, I'll, I'll buy them a drink out, out of apologies that they have to follow such an incredible act like me. Well, and the McIntyre Mule is coming back on the drink menu. So there you go. But With spicy chili vodka. Oh, yeah. Oh, she sent you guys the. Oh, no. We, she and I were chatting. Yeah. Nice. No, it's going to be tasty. Good. If you're in Austin next week, come drink up. Come drink some of Scott. Oh. Um, all right. Well, listen, guys, there has been some, um, like, like Scott alluded to, Andy. Manfred is positive and not positive. He is optimistic that they will not miss games. Um, that felt hollow to me. How about you? I, I don't know why you would think it's hollow. Um, pretty much if they don't come to a resolution by what Saturday, spring training can't start on time because pitchers and catchers were supposed to report Monday. So they don't work on Sundays. It's a whole thing. So literally we've got 24 hours before it's going to be late. So his 48-hour-old statement at this point, um, I don't know what he's basing that on. What I do find interesting is that the um, media, like people like Buster Olney, are fully willing to just carry his water and go, Absolutely. all going to work out. Look how good the owners are and look how good Rob Manfred is. Be mad at those mean old players for not wanting to come play baseball. It's a game you should love. Don't you Scott. sympathize with billionaires? I'm going to tell you why it's going to work out. I'm going to tell you why they're going to get all the games played. Seven inning double headers. Seven <laughs> inning double headers, baby. You better split days, seven inning double headers. So we can play at noon and charge people uh, a full ticket <laughs> price for seven innings. Let the guys go get a shower, grab some crab rangoon or whatever they're going to have there in the back. And, you know, some, um, some St. Louis bread co that's Panera for everybody outside of my area. And then we'll come back at seven o'clock that night. And play another seven innings and charge you full price for that too. And everybody's happy. I assume you're creating jobs when you do that because somebody's going to have to come and sweep all of the vagrants out of the stadiums between games, right? You absolutely <laughs> are. Hey, you know what? You need a job in the MLV front office, Mr. Tom Chesson, because that's exactly the way to spend that. We are creating jobs by reducing the number of innings played. Uh, look, you, you do something like that, though, it, it's still going to show up in stats that that th this is where it gets weird, right? It's still going to show up in stats that you played a full game. Um, it, it's, unless it's a no hitter and then it doesn't. Unless it's a no hitter and then you get an you get an asterisk larger than uh, what Roger Maris had there for a while. Uh, and um, and it's just, uh, yeah, that's I don't know. I, I'm I'm. You make the Rizzos of the world happy who want 
to play fewer games and you make the Yadier Molinas happy who tell their fan base, I'll play 174. My goal every year is to play 174. That'll win me a World Series title every year. Well, let's talk a little bit about two things that did leak out um, that the MLB, I guess, is willing to make a concession on or, or Ghost agree. Runners. Ghost Runners on every I, I wish it would. Ghost Runners and do-overs. How great would that be? I got to tell you guys, after Nicole having a Harris would like a do over in 2019, Andy. Well, Dusty Baker's coming to the mound. He's going to use his third do over of the game. That's his last one. It's kind of a <laughs> risk in the fifth inning. Hank Aaron, though, Hank Aaron was a big believer in do overs. May I also say, can we stop talking about things leaking out? I did have my first colonoscopy this week. So oh. if we could just not use that term for about okay. another week, I'll be, I can go hey. into detail if you'd like. Colin Brothers, is, mine's in 10 days. I've got hey, about, I, I have to have one in probably doing one in June. So look at us. You've um, never been in a foul well, room. One of the things the that, that did sort of that was that was released prematurely. Um, it does look like <sighs> universal DH is gonna whole, happen. Yeah, whole other whole other medical I got nowhere issues. to go, man. Um uh you, Andy, that's how I felt. That's how I felt. Andy, universal DH. I mean, for those 15 players who are going to receive more money, that's great. I guess. I, I, I'm i not a fan of the DH. I'm not a fan of the DH even being in the American League. And I know there's been a big movement among Astros fans that, hey, now that we're here and we see it, it's great. Why would I ever want to see a pitcher hit? There is always going to be part of me that thinks baseball should be played with every position player and every – body on the field hitting and taking a turn at bat i think the game is better i think there is less of the nonsense that goes on if a pitcher knows he has to go face another pitcher after pulling crap trevor bauer wouldn't be trevor bauer if he had to bat hey, joe Scott. kelly wouldn't be joe kelly um I, I this is this is where i'm actually shocked because you know for the last two or three times we've talked I haven't liked the changes that are coming about. I kind of like the universal DH. I, I do. Um, yes, it takes a, a bat out of a pitcher's hand, but it also creates 15 more jobs and a, 15 more starting spots, probably a couple of more spots on the roster overall. Um, it, it also is going to reduce the time of games, or it should, because some of this in and out, now we go to commercial break while, while guys are being shifted in the late innings. I know – Three minimum batters. That's supposedly but, changed but things. Wait, but wait, 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 wait. Does, does, does it reduce? Was does it reduce game time if you have more offense? And that's that's the pitch, million dollars. Most of those pitching changes though are happening between an existing. Well, not so much in the NL. Not so much in the NL because you got pitchers coming up to bat. You're doing double switches. Uh, you're, you're still making, you know, the lefty righty matchups are still played in a little bit, not as much as they were. But they're um, still, I, but like, if, but if you pinch hit for Wainwright. Yeah, all, all the relievers' warmups are happening in an, in an existing commercial break already. Yeah, you know what, guys? It probably is a wash. It honestly probably is a wash. It just, I guess, sitting at a National League stadium and watching, um, it, it takes okay. some guy Being twenty there, minutes to maybe. lumber off. Yeah, it yeah. takes twenty minutes for one guy to lumber out of the mound. Another guy, you know, ten minutes to look all cool, wandering in from the dugout. Then he takes his eight warmup pitches. Then we come back from commercial break. Um, and God, it feels like forever. I mean, if look, if I can get up, get a hot dog, something to drink, use the bathroom, get back in my seat and not miss a pitch, it took too long. Um, but so it, I, I guess that that's where I'm coming from on it. I, I'm for the universal DH, though. There are there are easy outs in the NL and there's not easy outs in the NL. Uh, based on who you're, who you've got at the plate for a pitcher, right? And an Adam Wainwright, who has the potential to actually take it deep to the opposite field, is different than uh, a, a, a Joe Schmo scrub who is over his last 142. So yeah, let's get somebody up to the plate that can actually hit the ball. Um, I think the other thing it's going to do is that you're pretty much unofficially saying we, we're eliminating stealing bases and bunting people over now that that's and yeah. that, that's been the primary role of a pitcher hitting right and so I mean, if you, yeah if you look at how many people are running that's not that's not the game anymore correct i completely agree with the andy um I, I think if you look at the at how many how much was ricky henderson lou brock tim Raines, those guys how much were they running compared to the math you know if you steal 20 bases now in a year mm -hmm. oh my gosh you're incredible right if you stole 20 bases 30 years ago uh, yeah, you were like 
That was pedestrian. Uh, you, you were, were 11th on your team, right? Yeah, exactly. You were the fourth outfielder who only played not in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. <laughs> right. Inning. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's already changed. Uh, small ball, as we know, it's kind of gone away, um, except in critical positions. I do think you'll still see people bunt, but only against the shift late in the season when they need a win. Okay. I mean, look, um, I don't know. I, I, I sort of, I don't want to watch pitchers hit. I don't think that an American League ma- – I, I don't think managers should be able to put in a lineup card and take a nap. And, and so it's the mm. weird dynamic of that. I do miss double switches, and I do miss – well, it's one to nothing. He's dealing, but he's up in the seventh. You know, I, but those, dis- those debates are part of the strategy of the game. So I'm very torn. I'm also torn on the other thing that came out, which was no more um, purely draft based on record, but going to a lottery – NBA style. Um, Andy, overall, like this is supposed to reduce tanking. What do we think? Well, I mean, there's still a gap, right? Um, I, I don't mind it. Um, there's still a gap, though, because I think the owner's proposal was the top three or the three worst records would be in a mini lottery at the top. Of them. The players union wanted eight, I believe, eight or ten. Um, so I don't know how they bridge that gap or if that is something they're even going to bother to try to bridge, you know, start it with three and work it way up. I, I don't mind it. It hasn't hurt the NBA. Um, and you've got two examples in the NFL and the NBA of how it works one way or the other. The NFL is straight. Worst record gets the number one pick and down the line. The NBA, I bored Jim to death. He has left the room. My God. Scott, that's good. Favorite. We can just, no, 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 just go with it. Enjoy the moment. Keep going. Um, keep going. Keep going. But I think the, the, You know, it it doesn't bother me. I I don't know that it changes the game, and I don't know that it really prevents tanking because a top 10 pick is better than a not top 10 pick. So if you are in the 10th worst record, the worst you can do is number 10. Okay. So does it it feel to you, though, Andy, does it feel a little bit like, um, um, like, okay, this is kind of smoke and mirrors, though, so we make sure we don't have to have a salary cap? Yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm saying because I don't – I don't know that I had to come is, back after the NBA talk. I was just kidding. He's dealing with uh, something. But continue, <laughs> continue. I, you know, male incontinence at your age is very normal, <laughs> and it's fine. We understand. Um, it's just, it, it's just a. I don't know that I care. Um, you know, I don't want to root for my team to ever have the worst record because you get the number one draft pick. Because unlike those other two sports that I just mentioned. The NF, the NBA, NLB draft is such a crapshoot. Projections are wild all over the place. And while I think maybe we've gotten better with analytics being applied over a scouting era, it's still your one one still not guaranteed to be playing in the major leagues ever. Yeah. So I mean, so they have a better I'm... chance than two one, but it's not for sure you're going to see this guy on your major league team at some point in the next three years. I think it feels timely though. I, I think what, what MLB is doing here is, is actually the right thing. Uh, however many teams it winds up being in the lottery. If I look at the NFL and you get the Browns, former coach Hugh Jackson saying, Hey, I was encouraged to tank. So mm-hmm. we'd get the number one pick. And so if I, if I, if I add that, if I take that into account uh, versus, you know, what you're talking about, Andy, it is more of a scatter shot. I think it's getting better because you have a reduction of the number of rounds that you can draft and the analytics are better. So I, I think by default, um, the, the draft, their drafting actually gets better, their targets. So if, if I take those two things into account, people are seeing reasons that the lottery could be good and, and, and the teams really, you know, may really tank. Oh, shock. Let me clutch my oh, pearls. I, I, uh, if, if I take that into account, if I take also into account um, the, the success, you know, hey, look, the NBA has a lottery night and people tune into TNT like there's a real game going on. That's, you know, they, they flock I mean, that's, to it. That's a true point, I think. Right, but also the NBA has lottery night because you know where you're drafting those guys from. And uh, with, the, with the advent of more European players and more African players and more guys from all over the world coming in part of that draft, in general, if you're going to go 1-1, you know who that guy is. There are... I, you know, great thing for ESPN, but they said they're going to broadcast 2,200 baseball games, college baseball games this spring. 
That's fantastic. But every one of those rosters has at least 25 guys on it, uh, 30 actually, with in you know 11, 11.7 scholarships, which is a whole different thing. Um, but there's a lot of players, and then you've got high school on top of that. It's really hard to get really excited about Al Leiter's kid. But I, use, I, I think you still have that in the you still have that in the NBA because some guy that has more consonants in in this land oh no no that's guys um the, you know that's from Latvia or Romania or wherever some guys that's seven foot four that I've never heard of nobody else has he's nineteen he's been playing professionally for three years now he's coming over to the NBA you know no 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 fan base in Dallas is going to go oh sweet we've got Igor Ingolovich coming which, to play for us you know I I, I don't, which, I don't but. To the point where I was trying to get to is I don't know it becomes a TV event because of that. The NBA draft lottery used to be a big deal because you were going to get the number one player from Duke or you were going to get Hakeem Olajuwon or you were going to get whoever. Yeah, and yeah. it's nobody watches the draft lottery now. It's on TNT. It's on for 30 minutes at halftime of another game just about during the playoffs. Uh, it's just something that's added on. The NFL draft, on the other hand, is something that people tune in for three days to watch. Well, there's no minor league. And I think that's why. It, it, you're immediately college football. Yeah, well, first college of all, it's football. college football. Okay, fair but, enough. Look, I think but you're I, drafting from the minor leagues in, in that. I, I, I also think that what, you know, and I, I do want to get this in. I think that MLB also during the year of COVID, when they were able to have uh, their draft, right? It, their drafts on ESPN, because there was absolutely nothing else going on in the world of sports. So they had that night where all eyes were focused on the MLB draft. I think that gave them a little taste. I, I, and I think they got that taste one. Hmm. That's pretty, that was pretty cool. We had a lot of eyes on us and I think they want to capture that again and anything they can do to add to the excitement of the draft. Let's face it. MLB out of the four major sports in North America, MLB has like the least excitement of its draft. So anything you can do to boost the excitement on that end, I think though, but and, and get and get a fan enjoy enjoying a team early on, maybe they'll actually watch the games, and I can increase viewership later. I don't I think, think, think they will thinking. though, because well, first of all, I don't think they will because to both of your points, a guy drafted in the MLB draft is at a minimum three years away from playing for your favorite MLB team. So, but the other thing I have is, and I'll be the guy on here that thinks. I look at these as these teams are businesses owned by people. I don't like the idea that you can't tear your team down to the studs and rebuild it. And I think, I think if we discourage tanking, which is of course is the word we're using to add a negative connotation to it. I think what you've done is you've really exacerbated the problem of rich and poor in the MLB. The, the, there are certain teams that have to tear it down and rebuild it every single year to stay competitive. Well, it, it, Getting back to that point, the other part of it is I don't know that tanking really matters unless you are the Astros and do something with it. Because the Pirates, technically, the Pirates and Orioles tank every year based on the current definition of tanking. They have nothing to show for it for the past decade for either franchise, other than some trade pieces they could give to teams that are contending. The Royals managed to be a world championship team in 2015 by tanking, but they've fallen right back down to their pattern because they're not developing those players. So yeah, even but there's drafting but there, one. But if you look at the, the bellwether for their 2015 team are the same as they are now, all of their minor leagues are, are either coming in second or winning their divisions. The idea being that will elevate. Right. But it gets back to this point of, I don't know. I, it's just, it's a frustrating thing. I don't think it's as big a deal I don't think tanking is as prevalent a problem because the results aren't immediate. In the NBA, it was a problem because you very easily could say, I'm going to get this Patrick Ewing. I'm going to sure. get him because he's going to be playing for me next year. I'm going to go get Al Leiter's kid. And guess what, Rangers fans? You're going to see him in 2024 if everything goes right. I hope you're still watching. And we're still waiting for Forrest Whitley, so it probably it might not go right. In, in but the if they're able to come – but if they're able to combine this with the other proposal that they have on the table to like give you extra money or whatever, you, if, if you, if you keep a guy, if you keep a, a star on your roster the whole year, if, if, if you put all of those people, are they putting this in there now with the thought that they're going to add additional things like that to it later so that maybe the, the ramp for that guy to get to the league isn't three years. 
maybe it's one and a half, maybe it's two, maybe it's three months, you know, and um, who, who's, wasn't it, Nolan Ryan's, yeah, who's, whose kid was it that, that not Nolan Ryan, um, uh, uh, Houston Street, Houston Street, when he came, came out of, uh, of college, I mean, he was, he was in the pros in a couple of months. Maybe you'll see the same thing in this. But I mean, James, hey, Street's, you, James Street's kid. I was trying to remember yeah, Texas you, sports fan heroes. I'm not good at that. But then, you, but then you have the problem with the players union saying we've got too many minimum income, minimum um, salaried players because you're pulling college kids up in that first year. Sure. That, Look, I, I mean, absolutely. Ultimately, I don't have much of a problem with this. I want to move on to the next topic, but ultimately, I don't have much of a problem with it. I do think I just I get very sensitive to listening to how rich teams and fans of rich teams want to characterize how small teams and small market teams have to do their business because it's a, it, to me it's emblematic of the problem we're dealing with right now with the separation of rich and poor. And uh, and and I come from a team who's now willing to spend money, so it's not like it was really always been able to spend money, just didn't do it smartly. So I want to I want to be drafting at thirtieth every year. And I'm, 32nd when they're franchise. I, I, that's where I want to be every year. So well, it's going to be on that. Baseball is dealing with the same thing that other sports have dealt with in the past. And the way that other sports have dealt with it successfully is by instituting a salary cap. But baseball won't do it because I mean, we, we've talked long and hard about how that would actually be a salary floor and a salary cap would probably be the best thing to save the sport right now. But owners don't want a floor and players don't want a cap. And But, it, but let's move on to a player. Um, Trevor Bauer, I, we have to talk about him, I think. He was – they did not indict him. I did watch his video, The Truth. Um, I'm not going to say that I believe him. I don't believe him. However, the fact is he's good on camera. He's always been good on camera, and so there will be people whose opinions will change. Uh, Andy, we'll start with you. Um, does he play again in the major leagues, and for who? Um, yes, because somebody will pay him. Um, I don't know that it's the Dodgers. Uh, it, really, the Dodgers are probably a team that can afford to let him walk and void his contract, whatever legal mechanisms they have to do that to get there. But somebody will be attracted to the talent and will be willing to put it up. I, I absolutely see him as a guy, though, that uh, is going to continue to sign one-year contracts, A, because he likes to sign one-year contracts. It's kind of a thing for him. Um, but somebody will eventually, and somebody usually is New York. Somebody is usually the Yankees that are willing to go, Hey, with talent, everybody come here to win. That's fine. The other question I have uh, throughout this is how does this affect, uh, Tyler Bauer? I, I don't going, know. I mean, is, is he going to continue to be a thorn in Alex Bregman's side? That's really my big concern with this. I hope <laughs> Scott, what do you think? Well, I was reading an article <clears throat> on, um, on, on where Bauer might, might end up, and, and there was a strong case made that he would wind up in Houston. And I'll tell you why. I mean, it, yeah. yeah no, I, saw the, I, I saw the article. I know. So one of the things you have to think about also is that throughout the league, Houston kind of has a black hat right now, even though they shouldn't. And we've talked about that a million times. Yeah. The Astros have a, have a, have a bit of a black hat. So it's sort of like, you want us to be the bad guys? You want us to be the Raiders of the 70s? Uh, fine, we'll we'll take Bauer. Um, and what what are you getting with with Bauer? You're getting a 31 year old who has really good stuff. First of all, let's let's just say that over the course of a career, Trevor Bauer, um, his on field ability, I don't think is ever. It's not really questioned, right? It's all the stuff in the clubhouse. It's his mouth. It's his Twitter feed. It's you know his questionable actions in, in this case that almost got him indicted. Um, those are the problems. Well, if you got a manager like Dusty Baker, who's a good clubhouse presence, could you see front office coming down to Dusty and saying, could you handle this guy? You know? I, so yeah, I, do, I definitely, I don't think, know that the city of Houston would handle it. I don't know. And Andy will speak on that better in a minute, but, but Scott, let me follow up though. There's now, there is still talk though, that he could see another year suspension that, that they could sure. look, they're looking at a two year suspension the first of which being retroactive and partly to let the Dodgers figure out a way to avoid his contract. I'm sure uh, if that happens, does that change your, your math on whether he pitches again? No, I think he still can. I think it'll take a longer ramp up time for him to get ready and he'll need a full spring training. I don't think if he throws this year, you know, like, like most guys that have to sit out that long, 
he's not going to come out with with dominant explosive stuff. It'll find it'll take him a while to find it, and it may take a full season for him to find that. But is he worth the risk? Absolutely, uh, especially if you're a team that's building, you know, not just now for in, in the future, and you don't really care. Like like Andy said, if you're the Yankees, um, if you're the Cubs, also the lovable Cubs with all of that money that they have behind them as well. And they're in rebuild mode. Could you bring this guy in with a strong manager and, and get him through quite, quite possibly. I, I, I think with him only being 31 and getting two years of rest on that arm at this time uh, with modern medicine and all these marbles, I, I think he still has a potential six to eight year career of okay. being a really good pitcher. So, yeah. Andy, let's say he does uh, roll in and and he's wearing, you know, 90s Astros uniform on throwback Friday of the season. I mean, how how would that sit with you? Uh, with me personally, I wouldn't be a fan of it. I don't think the Houston franchise, with the amount of scrutiny it gets currently, could afford to have him on the roster. Um, would he be a talent upgrade? Yeah, he'd be a very – he'd be – Easily our number three pitcher behind Verlander and probably Lance McCullers at this point. Um, and that's with taking a year off, maybe two. But I think that the blowback that the Astros got from um, trading for Roberto Asuna, the blowback that they got from um, your friend from the front office who got fired after Osuna got a save in the playoffs in 2018 or 2019, um, and then the cheating scandal, um, the sign stealing scandal. I don't think they can afford the PR hit. I don't think Jim Crane and all his wondrous glory is ignorant enough of what that perception would be to allow that signing to happen. And I still think Trevor is going to require at least $30 million a year to put spikes back on. I don't think he's going to be interested in a true make good deal of, hey, I'll take 18 and show you what I can do. That's not his personality. I see him going and playing in Japan or Korea before he did that. Okay. Which honestly, he might do if he has a another year of suspension just to save pitching. Yep. Yeah. Not, not a bad point. Not not a bad point at all. Yeah. I just I don't know if he can stay in a media frenzy, uh, crazy place like New York or L.A. successfully if he gets with a good team in a smaller market. Uh, if he's you know, a, I, I yeah, see I, and see, I think he was kind of a perfect fit for the Reds. The, mm, the ba- yeah. very baseball hungry organization who will find money if they can but no media attention is given to them anymore. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. The Yankees, yeah. I think, could cover for him if he's successful. New York would forgive a lot of things. Yeah, and I, you know, I, um, I think, I think that the whole thing is weird. Um, I think you're right, Andy. I think right now the Astros have circled the wagons with their fan base. I think the last thing they're going to do is repeat the Roberto Asuna oh. thing because it really did fracture the fan base. I know, Scott, oh. you weren't so much into it, but – Sure. I mean, it was. The other part of that is if you're going to pay um, Bauer $30 million, let's just say, why didn't you pay Correa $30 million? Yeah. All right. So the, so then let me let me finish it up with, okay, we talked the logistics of, of whether he will or not. Do you think he should be able to? If you were commissioner of, the, of MLB, Andy, would you allow him to play again? No. Scott? Yeah. And I'm definitely a hard no. I think we have to start drawing the line somewhere. I just don't believe. But, you know, um, I guess I make the same argument. I mean, you know, he wasn't indicted of anything. But I don't know. I I think that's where I'm sitting. But that is our show. Uh, We will be back um, soonish. We'll know that for sure later. But, guys, have a great weekend. Thanks for jumping on the joys of Mudville. Jim, I'll see you soon. And we're going to a ball game within two weeks. Think about it. Right at the old